Um, it seems fitting that uh, we have such a dramatic change in the weather outside for this presentation on atmospheric effects. Um, <laughs> So since this presentation on depiction is on depictions of land, I'm grateful to uh, the organizers of the symposium and to Eugene yesterday for emphasizing uh, the land acknowledgments uh, for where we are. Um, while this research in this presentation might seem a little old hat um, in this uh, I think it's important uh, in recontextualizing uh, Dixon's landscapes um, that make it interesting. So for his own part, Dixon largely played a role in promoting idealized images of the American West, as we've seen, situated on perpetuating the ideals of the West as an exciting, romantic, and mythical place. Typical of his works are images of cowboys and Native American figures in an idyllic, though sometimes problematic, landscape, which become archetypes that found success in publications, advertisements, and other commercial interests at the time. In response to the commercialization of the West that followed in the late teens and early 1920s, he increasingly turned to images of the landscape that celebrated the West as an unspoiled place. As noted in Dixon's scholarship, while he still pursued commissions and commercial success of his figural images, he also delighted in showing the West as a, prime, as a spiritual place of solitude and personal growth, putting the land in perspective as a timeless place with agency and power to resist the change Dixon witnessed around him. As a result, landscapes that dramatically diminish or remove representations of cowboys or indigenous people entirely became a way for Dixon to explore and present the landscape itself without it becoming associated with the symbolic terms connected with such figures. With this, Dixon began turning his attention to the sky and exploring the atmospheric effects of the West. Air, light, haze, clouds, rain became qualities that play a role in our interpretation and connection with the landscape being depicted, features that became paramount to the success of Dixon's later work. Today, I want to talk about Dixon's unpeopled landscapes from the last few decades of his career, which focus on his attention to the West's atmospheric qualities, and try to put them into perspective as a genre of artistic output that could do more in helping our understanding of Dixon's visual use of and his thinking about the role the West plays in the American consciousness. While some emphasis has been placed on the formal qualities of Dixon's late landscape images, like the plains from 1931 to 33, shown at left, and upstairs in the exhibition, or Desert Southwest from 1944 at, at right, little credit has been given to how these images function or to what Dixon might have been trying to achieve through their creation. Scholars address these typically smaller paintings as part of Dixon's overall artistic output by briefly describing them as offering an escape or as works that depict the, quote, spirit of the West, unquote, or images that offer, quote, a simple kind of truth, the way the West looked to those who lived there, unquote. Though brief, Donald Haggerty offers one of the foundational analysis of these, image, of these images by describing them as scenes through which Dixon, quote, did not want to interpret the West as much as he wanted to explain through art what it meant to him, unquote, citing Dixon's poetic and spiritual approaches in his attempt to depict the West's human and physical landscapes. Increasing the field of stylistic analysis of his works is not the point of this project, so I'll be brief in my next few slides. But tracing Dixon's stylistic trajectory through the last few decades of his career allows us to note what features in the landscape remain constant through his changing style, and therefore what features stand out as important to how Dixon wanted to frame the West. In looking at this, it becomes apparent that Dixon was not only interested in physical typographies of the West, but had a constant interest in the Western atmospheres and how it worked with those physical features of the land. Shifting from detailed illustrative techniques to a more painterly type of impressionism in the years leading up to the 1920s, we see early attempts at depicting an unpeopled landscape resulting in impressionistic scenes that model the physical characteristics of the West. Render uh, images typified by Arizona Desert from 1915 is a perfect example of this early stylistic portrayal, where painterly brushwork gives us a vibrant rendering of sagebrush as our eye is led to the sunlit buttes in the distance. Above them is nothing but a wide expanse of sky rendered through dappled paint, which seems to flatten out the canvas and fight the depth created below. What stands out is Dixon's early interest in depicting the West 
by embracing impressionistic techniques also noticeable in paintings by Monet of using color and mark to suggest how atmospheric effects of light operate as physical and almost tangible properties within the landscape. In Dixon's work, we see that property used to meld foreground, middle ground, background, and sky into one indistinguishable whole, creating the implication that we are looking at the land through an atmosphere that unifies it in the tonal qualities of light. From this, Dixon began experimenting in the 1920s with a style that foregrounded what would easily become recognizable as his own, resulting in a combination of an impressionistic color palette used in concert with modernistic techniques learned from his experience as a commercial billboard artist and muralist. But the observation of the atmosphere as a participant in his images will still persist. The principles employed in later paintings can be traced back to a series of moonscape images, which include this painting titled September Moonlight from 1921, which uh, that Dixon credited with helping him arrive at a new style of representation that is rightfully pointed out in the trajectory of his career as moving slightly away from impressionistic tendencies to present a, quote, striking gain in psychological force and spiritual quality through dominance of pattern and line of mass, rhythm, and space division, end quote. On the surface, this painting is a straightforward composition. Rolling hills in the foreground progress up towards a brown butte. A dark uh, blue cloud formation dominates the image, dispersing into large finger-like tendrils before fading into a pale violet at the top of the composition and seeming to thin in the atmosphere to allow the moon to shine through and illuminate the ground we see before us. His mature style seen in Desert Southwest from 1944 not only becomes a further refinement of this use of flattened color combinations and ideas of visual contrast, but also present a refinement in his use of atmospheric effects created through these stylistic choices. This work offers a similar composition to his impressionistic painting, Arizona Desert, and again we see the use of an atmospheric quality in the landscape. But here, given more gravitas, as Dixon trades that painterly impressionism with a smooth refinement on the surface of the canvas. In this case, we see Dixon presenting us with a visible atmospheric quality of the air. There are several other works in the exhibition upstairs that do this to varying degrees. Some employ the use of crisp, clean air that bring distant features into sharp focus, and others engage in even thicker murkiness, preventing us from truly experiencing the West. Here, we see Dixon blanketing the landscape in an atmospheric haze that shrouds the entire composition, becoming a palpable force which reduces even bright colors in the foreground to soft pastels, and affects our vision of the sky itself, which through this hazy atmosphere can't easily be read as a clear sky, but cannot quite be defined as overcast either. The ambiguity and contradiction in the landscape presented through such atmospheric depictions often go unnoticed in Dixon's work, simply because they are atmospheric effects that we have experienced in one circumstance or another being in the West. This haze is typical of the hot southwest desert air rising off the ground and obscuring the view, our view of distant mountains, as is the clear definition of a storm off in the distance uh, on an otherwise perfectly sunny day, as we see in the plains. So the short discussion on style is only meant to note the continuing emphasis that Dixon placed on such atmospheric <coughs> effects and such atmospheric elements throughout his exploration into depicting an unpeopled West. With this in mind, I propose that thinking about these images can be more than thinking about Dixon depicting his fondness for the American West, and that considering broader context he's reacting to and framing these images with can help us understand deeper ideas he, embed he is embedding into such landscapes and how he is using the Western sky to do it. But here's where things can start to get interesting in our interpretation of such features, in that Dixon was a storyteller through his images. All throughout this conference have been discussions on how Dixon has created narratives through his works and meaning through their peoples. It would be disingenuous of us to, to suggest that the same is not happening here, or that these images are simply pretty pictures that do nothing more than depict the West simply because there is no figure to interpret or obvious narrative to read. As an artist, the conscious decision to foreground the landscape and make such atmospheric effects palpable in these works make them interesting to question what their purpose might be, a question that further leads to Dixon's depictions of the Western atmospheric elements and the power that they hold 
hold as being able to create meaning in these works. No other atmospheric element seems to have held as much power for Dixon as clouds. It has been noted by Dixon uh, scholars that Dixon loved clouds because they, quote, embodied this tantalizing presence of the ghostly, the spiritual and natural creation, end quote. In some cases, meanings of these can be directly implied through the context surrounding the creation of images that feature them. Sketches created on Dixon's 1923 trip to the Walpi on the Hopi Reservation, clouds of uh, Hopi land and clouds and mesa, depict through his close observation of these natural formation, clouds that seem to hover over and haunt the landscape. In discerning meaning from these, it seems interesting that the popular narrative surrounding the creation of these two sketches suggests Dixon, so irritated by the crowds of tourists gathered to watch a spiritual Hopi snake dance asking for rain, turned his attention away from the spectacle in order to depict the natural promise of rain in the clouds themselves. In Clouds of Hopi Land, we can even see Dixon's vertical pencil marks over the distant butte to imply rain is already on its way. This shift in attention from the spiritual dance to the natural phenomena suggests an early unseen desire to depict these, nat these natural atmospheric effects as giving the land agency by having no reaction to human intervention and instead suggest the unyielding power of nature. This same implication of the enduring power of natural atmospheric effects appear in later cloud and storm paintings such as the plains. As previously noted, on the surface, images like this could be interpreted as accurate representations of distant storms in the West, rendered in Dixon's modernist style. But deeper reading of that storm sweeping across the landscape pose the possibility of taking on similar subtext to notions of the, uh, of the atmospheric sublime in national landscape paintings of the Hudson River School, in that the distant storm is something we have no control over and therefore becomes symbolic of something greater. Such interpretations, while sounding like a bit of a leap, are founded in Dixon's training with how to think about depicting nature, specifically the training rec uh, Dixon received in plain air landscape painting from the Hudson River School luminist Raymond Dab Yelland, whose 1879 painting View of Monterey Bay is here at uh, the museum, but is unfortunately in storage somewhere. Dixon has acknowledged taking inspiration from other artists and their styles at various points in his career, most notably with his relationship uh, to Frederick Remington and Charles Russell in their influence in depicting cowboys and Native American figures. But when it comes to turning away from these subjects and focusing on the landscape itself, there emerges a curious connection between Dixon's work and his training under the Hudson River School Luminist. This oversight and how we see this connection can be mostly attributed to the fact that this training was brief, only lasting a few months uh, at the art school in California, and that the impact of Yellen's style on Dixon's art was quickly overshadowed by his success as a commercial illustrator. But in his biography from the 1930s, Dixon acknowledges a lifelong friendship with Yelland and specifically credits Yelland with giving him his first and only formal instruction in landscape painting, recalling that it was done so, quote, with his sympathetic criticism and encouragement, end quote. In light of this, it seems fitting that when turning to modes of depicting the landscape, we can look for evidence of Dixon referencing the lessons learned from Yelland to craft such scenes, both physically and potentially even symbolically. This association suggests that Dixon's unpeopled landscapes and the atmospheric features used benefit from being interpreted in much the same way we translate Hudson River School and luminist images that take their cue from transcendentalism to create a sense of an atmospheric sublime with relation to the land. As Angela Miller notes in her essay on 19th century American art, the latter half of the century saw artists presenting paintings which emphasized personal awareness of the landscape and coalesced around experience of, of immersion in particular places, opening uh, the way to fresh exploration of nature in which self and nature are mutually defining." End quote. Writings of Emerson and Henry David Thoreau or Thoreau became significant forces in the creation and interpretation of such images and their advocacy that one can become closer to oneself and to divine spiritual forces through direct engagement with nature and the natural forces found within 
As such, the notion of the sublime too became a powerful force with which older landscape traditions have been interpreted, identified by Barbara Novak as being absorbed into spiritual and nationalistic views of nature as a sense of awe and mystery being, quote, intimately connected with the power the landscape exerted over the American mind, end quote. As such, beyond formalistic similarities between Dixon's contemporaneously modern style and the Hudson River School ideas practiced by Yelland in the 19th century, is an interpretive connection that can be made in the way we are asked to experience the landscapes, in terms of what the features Dixon is choosing to paint are symbolically seeking to do. This is especially true when it comes to the symbolism associated with the atmospheric effects of Dixon's landscape paintings. In keeping with Dixon's painting The Plain in light of this discussion, it seems that interpretations of that storm cloud and its uh, position in a rather pastoral setting can easily take on the same associations with storms created in Hudson River School paintings of the West, such as Albert Bierstadt's A Storm in the Rocky Mountains, Mount Rosalie from 1866. This is an image of the sublime, an image of nature that is wild and untamed by Euro-American standards, and one that shows how Bierstadt was a master of luminism, using the light in this picture to dramatic effect, creating an eerie, almost spiritual atmosphere emphasized by the imposing storm dominating the mountain across the picturesque valley. The gloom often created in such images through storms like this, speak to the demise of the unspoiled world. Although the wilderness is presented in a bucolic valley to be tamed under the divine light of providence or westward expansionism, the brewing storm clouds exemplified in Hudson River School traditions spiritually remind the viewer of the ultimate power of nature to both give and to destroy. We can bring this back to Dixon's work as well. And I'll go back to the plains for a moment, where we can interpret paralleled sentiments through the way Dixon allows similar tensions to manifest themselves between a pastoral landscape versus the wilderness creeping in, or more prominently, through this welcoming sun-filled panorama that offers the promise of prosperity juxtaposed against the foreboding downpour of the storm clouds in the distance, which can either offer life-giving rain or lethal devastation. Recognizing that Dixon was not operating in isolation poses several interesting avenues for thinking about Dixon's intent, which not only look to the past, but also to forces outside the West itself. What is interesting is the fact that we see these types of unpeopled landscape emerge in Dixon's career with any regularity at the end of World War I, continuing through the Great Depression, and culminating in his mature style with the onset of World War II. These outside forces, if not directly affecting how Dixon was creating these images, as I assert, certainly affect how they were seen by the public. As noted in a 1940 Los Angeles Times article promoting his work, quote, if World War jitters have got you down, drop into the Baltimore Salon and see the great Southwest through the eyes and temperament of the desert's foremost pictorial interpreter, Maynard Dixon, end quote. Such endorsements suggest that reading the tensions created by the atmospheric effects Dixon used in these landscapes and reading uh, how these atmospheric qualities interact with the land itself could reflect deeper tensions and anxieties in the greater world around Dixon. If we follow this path combined with older art, uh, artistic suggestions previously discussed, then images like this, or Autumn Evening, or Mesas in Shadow, also in the uh, exhibition upstairs, then have the power to take on less nostalgic interpretations and more nationalistic interpretations. This form of reading would put Dixon's unpeopled landscapes not in a realm of isolation in the face of a vanishing West, as first addressed, but more in line with notions of the West as a place for the nation to come together in a final frontier. As often noted, Dixon despised, quote, the hate propaganda, red baiting, and profiteer profiteering of the World War period, and general collapse of what he termed American idealism, end quote. With this in mind, it's not too far-fetched to consider the welcoming and idyllic landscapes presented here for us to inhabit and quote-unquote tame as a space to rekindle that American idealism, a safe haven from outside forces like war, politics, or that storm, which we can bear witness to from afar, but that has little effect on us at present. 
This recalls the imagery in Bierstadt's Storm in the Rockies and general overtones of expansionism to find a uniquely American spirit that I think is not only worth noting, but is worth adding to the tool chest of interpreting Dixon's unpeopled landscape works from these decades. Although many of these Hudson River School luminous paintings are not unpeopled, featuring indigenous encampments or colonizers moving in, their notions are still transferable or even reinforced with images by Dixon that don't remove the figure entirely, but dramatically diminish them within the landscape. One of the most famous of these images is Cloud World from 1925, a landscape that presents a panoramic view of the West with distant mesas receding into the horizon and over three quarters of the composition given to space that allows clouds to move three freely through a clear blue sky. But this landscape is not completely unpeopled, as once our eyes focus within this dazzling display of nature, we notice two figures on horseback in the distance. Their size makes it impossible to determine ethnicity or race, and our minds quickly dismiss them as we return to Dixon's sky. Their presence, however, solidifies the notion that this is an inhabitable land conjuring notions of manifest destiny, westward expansionism, the sublime, etc. But their scale reinforced the sublimity of nature and power we are meant to understand the West to hold, especially through reframing Dixon's love and careful adherence to its atmospheric conditions and use of the Western sky. Thank you. <laughs>